This is the second video in our series on the basis of heredity. In this video, we're going to look at some of the variations on Mendel's themes that my daughter taught you last time. If you haven't watched that video, click on the link up here and watch that one first. In a normal Mendelian cross, we have one trait, let's say color, controlled by one pair of genes, so we're going to write two letters in right there, that come in two alternate forms, let's say red and white with one allele usually dominant over the other one. So we'll give a capital R to the red and a little r to the white. So if we were to cross a homozygous dominant red flower with a homozygous recessive white flower, all of our offspring would be heterozygous and red. That's our normal Mendelian cross. In this video, we'll look at exceptions to this basic pattern. Our first variation is called incomplete dominance. We still have one trait controlled by one pair of genes with two alternate forms. However, one allele is not completely dominant over the other. In the heterozygote, the alleles will blend. So if we cross a homozygous red flower with a homozygous white flower, what will the offspring look like? Pause the video and write down your answer. Well, though all the heterozygotes will be pink, there is no pink allele, but there's a pink phenotype. There's a blending in the heterozygote. If this would have happened in Mendel's pea plants, all of his F1 plants would have been medium in height as predicted. It's a good thing that they weren't, or we, have not, we would have not have understood the discrete nature of genes. Our next variation is codominance. In codominance, we once again have one trait controlled by one gene pair with two alleles, and neither allele is dominant over the other but also they don't blend. In the heterozygote, both of the alleles are expressed. One of the things we do in this type of cross is to change the key. Instead of big R, little r, we'll use a neutral letter like C and put a R superscript for red and a W superscript for white. This type of notation will be helpful later on as well. So again, when we cross our homozygous red flower with our homozygous white flower, Pause the video and think about what we're going to look like in the heterozygote offspring. Will they all be red? Will they all be white? Will they be pink? Well, this is codominant, so they're both expressed, and we have a flower that's both red and white. Co, both, codominance. Now, Mendel couldn't have seen this in the height uh, trait in his pea plants because you can't be both tall and short at the same time. So our next variation is called multiple alleles, where one trait is determined by one pair of genes, but we have more than two alleles, more than two alternate forms. So we'll add a yellow allele down here. So let's see what happens. When we cross a homozygous red with a homozygous red, we get red flowers. When we cross pure white with pure white, we get white flowers. And when we cross yellow flowers with yellow flowers, we get yellow. The question is, which alleles are dominant and which are recessive? To determine this, we have to perform some test crosses. Now I made up this example, so bear with me, but imagine we cross a pure red flower with a pure white flower and all of our offspring are red. We would determine that red is dominant to white and we'd add that to our key with a little notation like that. And if we cross a homozygous white flower with a homozygous yellow flower and let's say we got white as a result, then we would determine that white's dominant over yellow. And we'd add that to our key. So there's one more cross we need to make. We need to cross a homozygous red flower with a homozygous yellow flower. And again, I made this example up as I went along. But let's imagine that as a result, we got all yellow flowers. We would conclude that the yellow gene is dominant to the red gene. And now we'd have all the information we needed to do um, some crosses or some genetics problems with this multiple alleles situation. We've built our key th showing our three different alleles using this uh, generic notation. We've added to our key a notation that lets us know which alleles are dominant to which, and then we went ahead and wrote down the genotypes and their resulting phenotypes. Now, let's look at a real example of multiple alleles with blood type. Human blood cells have protein markers on the surface. The type of protein is determined by a pair of genes that comes in three different forms. There's the A allele, 
the B allele, and the O allele. And the A allele codes for the A version of the protein, and the B allele codes for the B version of the protein, but the O allele codes for no protein. It turns out that A is dominant to O, so we're going to designate the A allele with a capital I with the superscript A. And also turns out that the B allele is also dominant to O, so we're going to give the B allele an I with a capital uh, with a B on it, a capital I with a B superscript. And uh, since O is recessive to both A and B, we'll give it a lowercase I. But how do A and B compare to each other? It turns out that A and B are equal. This is an example of codominance. If you have the A allele along with the B allele, both will be expressed and your blood cells will have both the A and the B protein on their surface. So armed with this information, can you fill out this chart? Write down all the possible genotypes and their corresponding phenotypes? I want you to pause the video, take out a piece of paper, and try to fill in this chart. So how'd you do? I have these phenotypes, or these genotypes. I can get two A alleles together. I can get an A allele with an O allele, two Bs, a B allele with an O, the A and B allele together, or two O genes. And the corresponding phenotypes, A type blood, A type blood, B type blood, B type, A B type blood, we're showing both proteins, and finally this genotype gives us O type blood. Let's move on. Our next variation on Mendel's theme is pleiotropy, where one gene pair affects more than one trait. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this one, but imagine that one gene pair, two big A's, made you a tall, red, fast-growing flower. So there's one pair of genes affecting more than one aspect of the phenotype. In contrast to one gene pair controlling many traits, how about polygenics? Poly, many, genics, genes, where one trait is controlled by many gene pairs working together. The result is a trait that can have a broad range of expression. We can see examples of polygenics with some human traits like height, intelligence, and skin color. Let's think about skin color in humans. It cannot be explained by simple Mendelian genetics, or we'd have only two distinct expressions, light skin and dark skin. It can't be explained by incomplete dominance, we'd have only three phenotypes, light, medium, and dark. We could try to explain it with multiple alleles, but we'd still have a limited number of expressions, and they would be distinct. But what we see with skin colors is a continuous, gradual gradation of expression that's much more likely to be explained by many interacting genes. Now I've oversimplified it here, but it will make a point. Imagine that we had three genes that interacted to determine skin color. The more capital letters you get, the lighter your skin, and the more lowercase letters, the darker your skin. We can look at it in a Punnett square here, and we could uh, count the total number of lowercase letters and see how the result it would result in darker and darker skin. Again, this is a, a little bit of an oversimplification, but it, it helps make the point we have one trait here, skin color, that's determined by three pairs of genes rather than one pair of genes, polygenics. Now let's look at a specific type of polygenics called epistasis. For an example, we look at the color of coat in Labrador retrievers. Yes, there's the collective all they are pretty cute. Now, it's interesting that color in Labrador retrievers works in a regular Mendelian uh, trait. We have one gene that comes in two forms, black or brown, with black dominant over brown. So that this homozygous dominant genotype gives us a black lab, this genotype gives us a black lab, and this genotype gives us a brown lab. So, how do you get a yellow lab? There's no yellow allele. It turns out that there's a separate allele that determines whether or not the pigment can be deposited into the fur. The dominant big E allele allows the pigment into the coat, while the recessive little e allele blocks the pigment. So when we consider both genes, we have these nine possible genotypes. To see the phenotypic results, we can start by covering up the first two letters. It makes it real easy to see where the yellow labs come from. Anytime we get two little e's together, we block the pigment, and the result is a yellow lab, no matter what the first two letters are. So if we take this box away, and we consider what the first two letters are, we can see what the resulting phenotypes are. Anytime we have a big B with a big E, we have black, and anytime we have two little B's with any big E, we get brown.
you may notice that there are only two genotypes that give us brown labs and only three that give us yellow. So, and then four, that leaves four that give us black labs. So I want to ask you this, when you go to the dog park, what do you see more of? Black labs, brown labs, or yellow labs? Well, you probably notice that you see more black labs than yellow labs, and more yellow labs to brown labs. And now you know why. Okay, we only have a few more things to discuss before we wrap up. Linked genes, sex-linked genes, and environmental influences. Let's start with linked genes. Linked genes are genes that reside on the same chromosome. They introduce exceptions to the principle of independent assortment. And let's remind ourselves what the principle of independent assortment says. One pair of genes assorts independently of another pair of genes as long as they are on separate chromosomes. Well, it's pretty easy to see why linked genes don't follow the rule. But let's take a quick look anyway. Here we have two pairs of genes, A genes and B genes. An individual with these genes would have this genotype. They'd be heterozygous for both genes. Well, here's a different situation. An individual with these genes would have this genotype also, and the same phenotype as well. But the difference is, over here, we're not linked, and here, the genes are linked. So over here, when we use this for a genetics cross, we know that we'd follow the principle of independent assortment, and we have four possible gametes that we can produce. But over here, since we're linked, we do not follow the principle of independent assortment. If we get the big A, we have to get the big B because there, we get the whole chromosome. Whereas over here, the big A and the big B do not have to go together. Now, we could unlink genes with crossing over, but that's not a discussion for this video. Now, I was going to talk a lot about sex-linked genes, but uh, this video is getting kind of long, and I decided that it deserves its own video. So for now, we'll just say that sex-linked genes are genes that are on the X chromosome. They're found on that X chromosome, and therefore, when we look at different genders, they don't carry the same numbers of these genes, and we'll see a different pattern. But like I said, I'm going to make a whole video about sex-linked genes. So finally, we move on to our last topic, how the environment affects the expression of genes. We can see a couple different examples of this, but let's talk about hormone influences at first. For example, with beard growth or baldness. Now we know that men can grow crazy beards and thankfully women usually do not. However, it's not that women don't have the genes for beard growth. They do. They're just not expressed. Except for my Aunt Ida. I'm just kidding. I don't have an Aunt Ida, but you know what I mean. There are some women who, have, who express these facial hair genes. The difference in expression is being controlled by hormones. We call these sex-limited traits. Even though the genes occur in both genders, the expression is limited to one. What about baldness? Mm -hmm. This is a sensitive issue for me. Baldness can occur in both men and women, but it's more often expressed in men. It's a sex-influenced trait. Again, the genes for baldness are found in both genders, but expressed more easily, in this case, in men. Let's look at some more obvious examples of the environment affecting expression of genes. Here we see a tree in Hawaii that has been shaped by a constant uh, wind from the south over its entire life. Certainly the genes for this tree did not dictate that the branch would only grow on one side. Um, it's being influenced by the environmental pressure. And here we see how the Himalayan rabbit's coloration is influenced by temperature. In fact, you can shave the fur off the back of one of these rabbits, uh, strap an ice pack to them, uh, keep keeping the ice pack cold, replacing it as soon as it melts, and the fur that grows back underneath that ice pack will grow back dark in color. So temperature is affecting the expression of uh, this, these genes for color. I guess we're in, on its body where its temperature is cooler than the, than the rest of the body, the, um, this dark color is expressed, but where its body is warmer, uh, the dark color is not expressed. The point is, while genes give us the blueprint, what gives us the genetic predisposition for traits, the environment can and does shape expression. So that does it for part two. Come back for the other videos that will be part of this genetic series. If you have any questions, uh, leave them in the comments section below, and uh, I hope you learned something.